walks on front to find their food because vultures eat dead stuff. So that's why Scooter here does this for us. You can find it carry on the on the ground and then eat it quickly because there are also other types of scavengers out there looking for the same thing. But even though eating that dead stuff sounds kind of gross, it's really important for us though because vultures are our natural cleanup crew. And as she takes flight too, you guys can see the tips of her wings. They were white as a characteristic for black vultures. And like I said, they're out there cleaning up our environment. They're our natural cleanup crew. They're doing a lot to keep them be beautiful, safe, and healthy. They're helping to prevent the spread of disease and bad bacteria to none of the other animals, but people too. So we have a lot to thank them for. And here in Central Indiana, we'll probably see turkey vultures more commonly than black vultures, especially if you guys live around here. And one of the easiest ways that you guys can tell the difference between those two species of vulture is by looking at their wings. So as Skinner was flying by, I pointed out she had white tipped wings, but turkey vultures have white and silver all along the bottom. So next time you guys see a vulture swarm around, look up, and that's a great birding tip for you guys to identify some wildlife in your own backyard. All right, so now that we've got a bird here in North America, we're going to take a trip all the way to Africa, to the African forest ecosystem. Well, we're going to be the type of bird that's smaller than a vulture, but still very quick. And I'd say if you've ever have joined us, if you want to come up as close as you would like, come inside the pavilion, feel free, because we're going to get to meet a trumpeter hornbill. So the trumpeter hornbill, Grundy, he'll be making his way up here in just a moment. He'll fly up really high, I'll point out as soon as I see him. But watch, because he'll also have that same black and white coloration. But the smaller size is coming in right now. <laughs> If you listen to you, you hear that vocalization from him too. That's how they get the name Trumpeter Hornbill because it sounds like a trumpet. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to show you guys what it looks like when they catch those bugs. So I have a broom there right here and I'm going to toss it up. <laughs> yes, it feels just like that. <laughs> that was awesome. So with tosses like that with different kinds of fruit, because I have fruit berries up here, I also have some grapes. We're able to show off that acrobatic flight that these birds have. They use to catch those insects out of the wild. Now we're hearing this vocalization from Grundy too, so we're understanding why they have the name trumpeter, but the hornbill part comes from a structure on the top of his beak called a cast. So that cast is what makes it look a little bit bigger, kind of like a horn. And that's telling us two things, that he's a hornbill because the structure is unique to the hornbill family, but it also tells us that Grundy is a male because that cast is bigger in males than females. So that's the thing that we call dimorphism, where the males and females look different. And with Brendy here, that cast will actually get bigger as he gets older because he's only a little over a year old. His birthday was on May 1st. So he still has some growing to do. But when he takes flight here, watch how quick he is. Also watch how he flies because he'll fly in an S shape where he'll fly up and down and that's how he actually gains momentum or speed, that he can catch those bugs while they're flying out there. But something else about Grundy's flight is that he'll tuck his wings in. So the top of his flight, watch for him to tuck his wings in like a torpedo. He's hopping around, looking at all of you guys, and <laughs> lots of new faces. And he feels very comfortable for that perch. Him hopping back to that perch is probably going to be he's very comfortable up there. But you can also see he's looking around at his surroundings. So that's telling me that he might be a little bit on high alert. There are some local birds that nest here in these pillars. They're called crackles. And sometimes those crackles will come down and check Grundy out. So he's keeping an eye out for them because those crackles nest these pillars. So they're protected mommies and daddies. They're coming down to make sure these birds aren't going to get too close to them. But right now is actually the perfect time for you guys to see some training in action. So up here on the perch, I am helping Grundy to be prepared to get to the best spot to fly back to his crate. And you will see our team back there, our friend Chase. He's prompting him that big wave. That prompt is our way of asking Grundy to fly in that direction towards our other trainers. You see he's kind of lunging forward. There he goes. So sometimes these birds see a little bit more information with what we're asking them to do. But did you see how quick he was? And that up and down pattern. But when he taps his wings in at the top of his flight, that's a way of saving energy. So that's energy conservation that we're seeing in action. But we also saw a similar type of energy conservation with the vultures. So when our vulture friend Skinner was out here flying around, he does those big wings. They're perfect for soaring, and it's pretty effortless for vultures just 
soar around through the sky. And that's how they take energy because vultures are scavengers and they never know when they're going to find their next meal. So sometimes they spend a lot of their day just looking for a snack to eat. So it's very important that they also have energy conservation too. But really cool that we've seen it in two different types of birds from different parts of the world. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at another part of the world in Central and South America where the macaws are from. Don't worry, they'll be coming out. But before the macaws come, we wanted to go into a little bit more depth on how we train all of these birds. So we're going to have another special guest come up on stage before the grand finale. They're going to help us to show how we use positive reinforcement training. But before that guest comes up and before we get started with the training session, I'm going to be doing all the training. I think it's a help for somebody who would like to be a junior bird trainer. Anybody out there wants to be a junior bird trainer? Go ahead and close your eyes so I can get first. You stood up too. Hi. What's your name? Elizabeth. All right, you're going to be a bird trainer. Are you ready? All right, so I was using things like blueberries and cantaloupe to feed Brandy up here. And also, I was using some mice and stuff to feed our friend Scanner the vulture. But I'm going to get you some help. This is what the next bird eats, okay? So come on over here with me. Elizabeth, this will be our first training station. This is what you're going to do. Put your hand on the table just like this, with a closed fist, perfect. That's what we call a target hand. So this is where we're asking the bird to come to our hand and hold a target. So this bird already has history. They know that when they see this, we're asking them to come to our hand. And every time they do, we reinforce that by giving them food. So we're going to ask the bird to come across the table all the way to you. Give them all the pellet in your hand. Then we'll go ahead and flip it and add in a few more steps, okay? All right, you ready to be a trainee? Yeah, all right, so we've met a vulture, we've met a trumpeter for Bill, and now it's time to meet <laughs> Tina the chicken! <laughs> <laughs> she is my favorite chicken. <laughs> she is so cute. Now, Tina might look like a baby chicken, but she is full grown. Tina is a silky chicken. Uh, she might not look like a chicken, she might look like a dust lady. Your kids, 
your friends, your siblings. You guys can train anybody as long as you know what they like best. But all jokes aside, now that we know what's behind the training process, what's behind these magnificent behaviors, no. I think it's time for the cause. Are you guys ready for the grand finale? <laughs> all right, so we're going to see these birds land right from this perch. And you guys are going to see the lots of different colors, but also hear all the different sounds and noises, squeaks and squawks. So we're going to keep our ears open too. But everything that we're going to see and hear in this pavilion is actually becoming more and more rare to see in the wild because of declining macaw numbers. But there's a lot that we can do here in Indiana to help these birds out. So one of which is that we can buy all of our meat and produce that's grown locally so that we can discourage deforestation at their natural habitat in Central and South America because some of the dangers they face are the deforestation, the loss of trees, and these nests. You'll see these birds are pretty big. They need large tree cavities to make those nests. And they're also facing the illegal pet trade. But another thing that we can do is just come to the zoos. By being here today at the zoo, not only are you guys having a lot of fun and seeing a lot of really awesome animals, but you're supporting conservation because we help organizations that are out in the wild right now working to protect the cause, preserve them, and to preserve the beautiful flight of them flying over the treetops just like this. Thank you. 